The Deadbringer by E. M. Markoff All is not well in the land of Moenda. In the south, the Ascendancy has positioned itself as a dominant power by exploiting the people's fear of the unknown, twisting that fear into a campaign of genocide against the Deadbringers, a race capable of summoning souls and reanimating the dead. But in the great northern city of Apilance, Kira Vidal, a young Deadbringer, has escaped the fate of the rest of his kind, living in hiding with his uncle Uthau, plying their trade as morticians. Welcome to the world of the Eldoret. Episode 1, The Shining City It's a gray, rainy day in Opulence, with thick storm clouds barring the sun, turning streets into shallow streams that carry away the filth that had piled up over the long, dry summer. But the dreary weather did not deter Kira from running his errands or visiting his closest friend. Morning, Kira. How's your Uncle Utau? He's well. Say, by any chance, was your parlor the one that buried Mrs. Stone? No. Well, rumors been going around saying that she was murdered and that it was her daughter who did it. Though maybe the body passed through your parlor and that you could say whether it looked like a murder. I hear she looked like animals had torn her apart and that the city authorities might petition the Bastion for aid. No, I know nothing of it. Shame. I suppose you are used to seeing all sorts of horrible things, dealing with corpses as your trade. Well, let me know if you hear something. Telful. Ha! Huh. Here's half of the payment for the lumber ordered, with the other half being paid upon delivery. I'll give my uncle your regards. I'll have the delivery there, as promised. Take care, Kira. Thanks. You too. Foolish boy, coming here with the rain. That uncle of yours knows full well the river tends to overflow in the rainy season. Next time I see him, we're going to have a long talk. Though late this year, it is indeed the rainy season. Regardless, I want to see you, Ilya. Don't give me that coming-to-see-me business. You young folk already have enough on your shoulders without wasting your time on a bag of bones like me. Did something happen? You seem in low spirits today. Nothing is wrong. If you say so. I brought some cakes that I baked myself. I used a bit more sugar than I would have liked, which means they are very sweet, but coffee should help wash them down. And I also brought more coffee and spices to replenish your stores, since I saw you were running low. It's appreciated, but I've told you not to bring me such expensive things. I don't like feeling like a leech. You're not. And besides, I bought these with my money, not my uncle's. So it's my call how I decide to spend it. Silly boy. I'll get the water going for the coffee. Well, just make sure you make enough. No sense in wetting your lips and then be left wanting more. <coughs> Not bad. I wouldn't advise dropping your trade as a mortician for that of a baker. But your skill at brewing flavorful coffee is quite impressive. I'd like to think I had a hand in this. But I'm sure your uncle would say otherwise. I'm sure he would if he could, but he's more a tea drinker, so he would have to keep his opinions to himself. As best he should. Kira, do you ever think of your parents? Every now and again, but honestly, I don't and can't imagine my life without my uncle. Although I know he thinks of my mother. Every year, during the weeks leading up to my name day, he becomes very morose and tends to stare at me when he thinks I'm not watching. You don't bear much of a resemblance to your uncle, except in height. He confessed to me that your mother died giving birth to you, 
But I'm pretty sure he told you that. Yeah, he did, but he simply refuses to speak of her. And of my father? My uncle never knew who he was. Not surprising. Many children born during the purging do not know their fathers. My uncle does say that I don't get my eyes from the side of the family, so my father must have been from the Western Mountains. But he doesn't ever talk about those years, even though I have tried asking. I've always been curious to know what Mondo was like during the purging. The Nightmare Lords, damn those years. Nobody wants to remember them. Ilya, have you ever seen a Deadbringer's doll? So, when you're curious, this bag of bones is finally good for something, huh? <laughs> That's not what I meant. I have seen a Deadbringer's doll. Really? Should I say no instead? No, no, no. It's just that I know my uncle has seen a doll, but he won't tell me. Or at least I think he has. Actually, I'm not sure. Awfully curious, aren't you? Of course. I mean, it is a part of Moenda's history. I guess my problem is that I'm not sure if I believe what I've read concerning Deadbringers and their dolls. That dolls were no different from the soulless reanimated Risen? That they were monstrous corpses? If the Ascendancy heard what you thought of the printed words they spread as truth, you would not be sitting here. We may not be in the South. But watch that tongue of yours. I wouldn't put it past the people of Opulence to cry to the Bastion that you are a traitor. The Bastion is not the Ascendancy. <laughs> a horse is a horse, even if you dress it in silks. Fine, fine. Now tell me what dolls look like. The Deadbringer's doll had fake eyes that never blinked and were vacant and glassy. Their skin was lusterless, their lower arms and hands often discolored, as if they had been dipped in a deep red dye. Not surprising, considering they were once alive. But no, the ones I saw were not monstrous. And? And what? I can only tell you what a doll looked like. Sorry, I let my curiosity get the better of me. What's the matter? And don't tell me nothing. Must something be wrong? Can an old woman sigh if she wants to? Here, I have a gift for you. What is it? It's a blue amber comb, given to me by my partner when we first started seeing each other. When my daughter came of age, I gave it to her. She left it behind. <sighs> I'm old. I don't have anyone to leave my belongings to, and of the little I own, this is the most precious. I know you'll take good care of it. Thank you, Ilya. Then it's settled. Next time you visit me, I want to see your hair set with that comb. Gods know you have more than enough hair to play around with. It might even help you find a pretty girl. <sighs> it's not that easy. You know that. Besides, I don't want to fall in love and then wind up accidentally killing them. Nonsense. You're here after all. That touching problem didn't stop your father from seeking out and betting your mother. That's not an image I wanted in my head. Hmm. Your uncle wasn't very pleased when I discovered what your touch could do. No, he wasn't. He was afraid of that other people would become aware of it and that my life would be in danger. Your uncle can have a cruel tongue and a violent temper when he chooses to, especially when he believes your life is in danger. He's very passionate about keeping you safe, but you can't hide behind those parlor doors forever, even though I'm sure your uncle wishes you would. My uncle is the only living person I can interact with normally without having to wear these gloves for fear that I might hurt him. I love him dearly and will be content with my life as long as he's with me. A sweet sentiment to have, but also a dangerous one. We are not gods, but mere mortals whose lives quickly dwindle. One day he will die, and you will find yourself all alone in that grand house, surrounded by the dead. That is not life. If my fate is to be surrounded by the dead, then so be it. As for my uncle, I'll make sure he never dies. There you go again, saying things best left 
unspoken, lest it spread from mouth to mouth. I trust you. Besides, happiness isn't dependent on finding a partner, and the people in Open Lindsay are not really my type. <laughs> By the gods! Now that is something I can agree with. It's getting late in the afternoon. I really should get going before it gets too dark and Uncle starts to worry. Get going, boy. That parlor of yours is far enough on the outskirts of Opulence that you probably won't arrive until well after dark. I'll be back soon with more cakes for you to try. A bit less sugar, hmm? <laughs> okay. Episode 2. Locked Doors. In their lavish home and funeral parlor, on the outskirts of Apilense, Uthal Vidal tends to a grieving client, even as he waits for Kira to return from his errands in the city. She has been washed, clothed, and made up. Have you decided whether or not to have a viewing? I don't want people to see her as she is. I know she would have hated having people gawk at her. I won't let them laugh at her. I won't. I won't. She had been sick for quite some time. Yes, but it wasn't fair. She was a good and caring person, and it wasn't right that she should have been stricken so ill. Indeed. She must have been a kind woman. Even in death, the gentleness of her spirit is evident. Your words are kind, but her body is wasted. Her beautiful black hair thinned. Balding. She is a shell. The last days of her life ensured as much. <sighs> It's so awfully quiet without her. A part of me is grateful to the gods that she's no longer suffering, but the other part is stricken with grief, for I will never see her again, especially not the way she was. Is it evil for me to feel this way? No. The conflict you feel is testament to the love between the two of you. I know this is hard for you, but would you like to see her? Yes. I beg that you do not touch the lilies on the casket, for the stain has not yet cured. The weather has not been cooperative. What a cruel joke is this? This woman is not my partner. Is she not? Look closer. Do you take me for a fool not to recognize my partner of so many years? What your eyes sought was the wasted body she passed away in. My nephew was able to restore a bit of her dignity by fashioning a wig from his own hair. A small thing, it may seem, but I agree. The change is shocking. It is her. Oh, forgive me, my beloved, for not having recognized you. Oh, this must be a dream. I, I, it must be. If so, let me never awaken. I will return shortly. It was, it was more, more than, than a, a wig, wig Kira, Kira fashioned, fashioned for her. her. But, but that, that bit of information you do not need to know. Such a dreary day. It is getting late, and Kira has not yet returned from his errands. No doubt he went to visit Elia in the old town. If so, he will be soaked from head to toe, especially if the river overflowed. Stew for dinner was the correct choice. I should check on the client. Can I come in? Yes. I've decided to have a viewing. This way people will remember her as she was. Tomorrow, then. We shall hold the viewing in the morning and the burial in the afternoon. Will the headstone be ready also? I requested quite a bit of work. A broken pillar, partially draped by a veil and lightly entwined with broken rosebuds. Stonework is my nephew's talent. Not mine. Since he is not here, I can give no sure answer. Please don't worry. Your parlor has been too kind to both me and my partner. Your understanding is much appreciated. I will escort you to the door and begin making the preparations for tomorrow's viewing. <laughs> Thank you. Until tomorrow. Some, Some incense, incense should, help should help clear the air. air. Unlike, Unlike you, you, my dear, dear nephew, nephew, I am I not am fond of the smell of rot. rot. <laughs> Did, Did Kira, Kira forget, forget his, his house, house key? key? Can I help you? 
Uh, yes, I'm... I'm sorry to be calling at such a late hour. The living do not have a set schedule for dying. Please, come in. Now, what can I do? I need the service of a deadbringer. Deadbringer? Is that what they are calling morticians these days? My mother was murdered. The local authorities believe my sister is to blame because all property was left to her. Also, it doesn't help that they found her unconscious in the same room as our mother. But she's innocent. I I know she is. My sister is a strong woman, but the attack from all sides has been too much for her. Currently, she's living with me and my partner. She's in a pitiful and delirious state. I'm afraid of what she might do to herself. Please, please, I don't want to lose her as well. I am sorry for your plight, but you are in the wrong place. Also, a word of friendly advice. It is not wise to openly state your interest in a race that cannot be sought out or consorted with, on pain of a swift death from the authorities. Please! Don't push me out. Please tell me I'm in the right place. I've already been to some of the other parlors in the city, and they ran me out most viciously, assuring me that I was mad. I am sorry that this is happening to you, but how you came to such a notion is is absurd. Worthington. Excuse me? Worthington is an old friend of the family's. He confided in me that the owners of a mortician's parlor were the ones responsible for bringing to justice the murder of his youngest son. He said that the parlor worked in conjunction with the Bastion, and that the Deadbringer was one of them. Worthington didn't name the parlor or the Deadbringer. He also mentioned something about a binding seal. Please, sir, I'm not mad, nor do I mean any offense to your person if such an accusation offends you. But if I am mistaken, please tell me so. If your need is so great, then why did you not go straight to the Bastion? I feared that if I went first to the Bastion, they would bar me from seeking the Deadbringer, or turn me away, or lock me up. I realized that if I could find the Deadbringer on my own and explain my situation, maybe then the Deadbringer could intervene on my behalf. And the thought of coming face to face with a race so feared it was hunted to extinction was preferable. Your excuse is rather weak. It's all I have. Do you also not have a name? It is poor manners to propose business without introducing yourself. My sincere apologies. I'm Nathaniel Kirkstone, but please call me Nate. I strongly suggest, Nate, that you make time to visit the Bastion and ask to see Agent Kim LaFont. But what if the Bastion, or this LaFont, don't believe my story and think I'm seeking a Deadbringer for some malevolent purpose? I don't want to be locked away or put to death. I regretfully assure you that neither death nor eternal imprisonment await you. Although, make sure to ask specifically for Agent LaFont. Does this mean that are you the Deadbringer? Do not fret, for I personally will inform the Bastion of your plight. In detail. <laughs> now, if you would please leave... I have a funeral to prepare for. Oh, yes. Of course. You can come out of hiding from the hallway now, Kira. You are soaked from head to toe. I came in through the kitchen. I saw you made stew. I did? I have to call on Kim tonight. I know. I heard enough. But we will eat together before you ride out, right? Go change into dry clothes. I will warm up the food, and we will eat together, as we always do. I won't be long, Uncle. <sighs> Damn it. Why is this happening now? Why? Episode 3. The Bastion. In desperation... Mr. Stone has sought Kira's services to summon his mother's soul in order to prove his sister innocent of their mother's murder. Should word reach the genocidal ascendancy that a deadbringer resides in the northern city of Opiolense, Kira will be chained and killed. Aware of the danger, 
Uthel rides into Apilense that very same night to request guidance from their contacts at the Bastion, the ruling power in the north, who are secretly aware of Kira's true nature. Worthington's gratitude is shallow and his loyalty poor. The Bastion, and Kim in particular, will not be pleased. The binding seals used to silence tongues did not tighten in this case, Sal. They loosened. Your bitterness is merited, but talented spellcasters are difficult to come by these days, and seals are only as strong as their caster. A lecture, Sal? No, it's merely my way of saying sorry. But you knew one day the moment would arrive when Kira's true nature would be discovered. Or have you been living in a fantasy? I stopped living in a fantasy the moment Kira was born. And when I saw the Ascendancy's sanctifiers publicly butcher the last deadbringer, they proclaimed peace the second the woman's blood spilled onto the podium. And Moenda cheered. You haven't asked why Kim isn't here. It's rather late. It slipped my mind. Oh, yes. Where is High Councilman Kim LaFont? <laughs> Busy, but we'll see each other tomorrow, and I can relay the events then. Have you eaten? Kim brought back a wheel of goat cheese from further north. It's quite good, though a bit dry. Thank you. But I ate before riding out. Sal, did Kim tell you that he extended an invitation to Kira to become an agent of the Bastion? Kim hadn't told me. I'm assuming you said no, but why would Kira reject the offer? As an agent, it would mean immunity for him against all of the Ascendancy, and the Sanctifiers in particular. Our lives before belonged solely to us. We were unimportant, just two more people residing in Opulence. Now the eyes of the Bastion are upon us, and our lives are no longer ours. There is no such thing as immunity. Not any more. The Bastion has never forced Kira to do anything. We have only turned to him when all of our efforts have proven useless, and the talent of a Deadbringer is the only solution. True. But how many times can Kira say no before those in power decide to tighten the leash? He was spared death upon discovery because he proved useful to you. But what good is a tool if you cannot use it at will. Kira is not a tool. And that is why Kim's offer was turned down. If Kira were to become an agent, then he would truly become a tool. Not everyone in the Bastion feels as you and Kim do. To believe otherwise is a fantasy. And the simple truth is that the Bastion did little to protect the Deadbringers during the purging. I have no doubt they would try just as hard to protect Kira. Itau, no one in the Bastion is a tool. We're not the Ascendancy. No, you are not. But that is my point. The Bastion may be powerful in the North, but it is nothing compared to the Ascendancy, which holds full power over the South, and even now has great sway in the North. And what has given the Ascendancy the upper hand all these years? The fact that its elite warriors, the Sanctifiers, are uniquely composed of Katarus, Roerden, lesser spellcasters, and others, all fiercely loyal to its cause. The Bastion arose during the Pershing to counter the powers of the Ascendancy, but it has never managed to be its equal. But what if a Deadbringer were to join its ranks? Kira would help shift the scales in favor of the Bastion. Not much, but a little. I will not have him become a pawn in a petty power struggle. Nor would I. Listen, it's best if we put our views aside, at least for tonight. Forgive me, Sal. I did not mean to take out my frustrations on you. No, you meant that for my partner. How does the remainder of your week look? Tomorrow is booked, but thereafter we are available. I suggest turning down any new work that might come up, at least for this week. The Bastion will want this matter settled quickly. How is Kim? And you? Kim's kept busy. As for me, I wish the healers had not limited my hours at work so needlessly. Kira has visited me a few times when I'm home, 
He brings me cakes that are a tad too sweet, and chats about everything and anything. Yes, I know. I should have come to see you sooner, but... <sighs> the loss of my baby reminded you of your sister, didn't it? It's okay. You don't have to say anything. The healers told me that the grief will subside with time, but it doesn't, does it? It's been two months now, but this sense of loss is the one feeling that never truly leaves. With time it's become bearable, but it's always there. You have to pretend to be strong. To pretend that when you're alone, the memory doesn't creep up, trying to drown you. And you don't want people to ask what's wrong, because if they do, you'll be swept away with it. So, you smile. <sighs> Kira's name day was a few days before you lost the baby. I... Uh, I should have come to see you and offer my support. Forgive me. Grief has no prescribed way of behaving. It's an enigma. I suppose so. Get the parlor's affairs in order, and prepare for a summoning before the week is out. Once a formal order is given, I will send word with Tim. Have you discussed with Kira whether or not he'll consent? It is in the best interest of all that Stone's request be fulfilled. However, I would ask that you find a more adept spellcaster. Fair enough. I know you don't have faith in the Bastion, but have faith in my partner and me. It's the least I can do after what he sacrificed. To help us bring justice to the murderer responsible for the death of Worthington's son and of so many other innocent children. Sadly... Good intentions are not always rewarded. It is ironic that the very conscience that compelled him to reveal himself to you, his desire to secure the safety and freedom of others, is what compromised our own freedom. Kira's actions were honorable. He should never regret that. Honorable? Oh, yes. But if honorable people were themselves honored, then there would still be dead-bringers roaming the land. That was uncalled for. Damn it. I should leave. My concern has rendered my mood dour and my tongue harsh. And you deserve none of it. Yes, it's late. I think we're all on edge, and will continue to be so until all this is over. Afterward, you must promise to come visit me as the friend you are. Thank you, Sal. And I will. Episode 4, Corpse Road The Bastion has approved Mr. Stone's request to have Kira summon his mother's soul back from the beyond. The following night, Kira, Uthal, Mr. Stone, and two Bastion agents journey south of Opulense for several miles down Corpse Road. Their goal? The long-abandoned cemetery, Corpse Hill. A full moon hung overhead, illuminating the small group marching up the road in single file. Udao led the way, hauling a wooden cart laden with a tall mirror made of polished sardonyx, loosely covered with a thick tarp. Next came Kira, who helped steady it as they made their way up the pitted, stone-strewn path. Trailing close behind was Agent Tim and Mr. Stone, his scared eyes seeming even larger in the light of the oil lantern he held out before him. In the rear was Colonel Sal, one of Uthal's main contacts at the Bastion. No matter how troublesome the path may become, Mr. Stone, do not stray from it. Your feet may thank you, but your soul will not. I don't doubt your words, Mr. Vidal. It was quite a hassle to convince the parlor within the city to bury my mother at Corpse Hill. They too were wary of the path and begged that no one stray from it. But when I asked them why, they could not provide an explanation other than that the fields are cursed. How did you convince them to bury your mother at Corpse Hill? Money. Maybe we should have brought some money to toss on the road, huh, Kira? Hmm, no way, Tim. No, oh, the Golden Blender would have convinced me to accept such a request. And that's why I call them fools. If you aren't comfortable here, then the gods help anyone else. Don't you agree, Colonel Sal? I agree. There's something vile about this place. <laughs> I'm glad. 
I'm not the only one who is frightened by the superstition surrounding this area. Although, I must admit, I had expected more courage from agents. A courageous person does not ignore superstition, but acknowledges it and examines it. You would do well to heed our judgment, for this area is indeed dangerous. How so? This road, Corpse Road, Coffin Way, Procession Way, whatever name you choose to call it, was used solely for the purpose of transporting the dead. It became bad luck to use it for any other purpose than death. Depending on whether a path is good or bad, it can steal away the souls of the dead and trap them. These sharp rocks and holes are meant to trip the casket bearers and cause the corpse to fall onto the ground. When that happens, the soul of the departed is ripped away from the body and swallowed up by the path. Or at least, that is how I understand it. For whatever reason, this path is bad, and it has swallowed many souls. As for the why, I have no explanation. But why are we, who still have blood pumping through our veins, in peril? I have heard it said that the lurking evil tainted this part of the land during the First War. In such a place, the living can become shadows that wander aimlessly until death takes mercy upon them. Others say that dead bringers poisoned the land as a way to exact revenge. But if this area is tainted, then why is the path passable while the land beyond is not? Corpse Road was laid long ago by the Roerden. I suppose they wove some sort of enchantment into the stones as they were laid. But this path is like any other path in the sense that, if it is not maintained, it will degrade with time. You are a wealth of knowledge, aren't you? I see now why the Bastion holds you in such high esteem. After all, the Deadbringer is not you, but the boy. But the both of you work together very closely, don't you? Mr. Vidal's knowledge is our safe passage, and the boy's ability is your sister's freedom. And yes, they are under our protection. I suggest you commit that fact to heart. Kira, why have you stopped helping me push the cart? What's going on? Your face. Kira, you know you're not supposed to call upon death without first informing me. Explain. I didn't call upon death willingly. Corpse Road is evil. There are too many bitter souls trapped here and something has excited them. They are whispering that they long for blood. Nightmare lords be damned. Is this because you're a dead bringer? No, I don't know. I feel like it's more than that, but I can't pinpoint what it is. Do you feel that you can continue forward? I think so, yes. But not at this pace. I don't want to linger on this path longer than necessary. Itao, do you believe it's safe for the rest of us to continue onward? Yes. Just do not err from the path, no matter what. If Corpse Hill is just as vile, then it will probably be best to turn back. But I have never visited the cemetery, and cannot say if it is, or if it is not. Understood. Here is what's going to happen. Kira will go on ahead and make sure that the cemetery is safe for the rest of us. If so, then the summoning will continue as planned. As you heard, there is evil lurking about this path. Stay alert, keep close, and tread carefully. My respects to your late mother, Stone. But she had poor judgment in her choice of resting place. My apologies, Colonel. Kira, go. Once you feel better, you have my permission to make any preparations necessary to carry out the summoning. That includes calling on death. <laughs> be careful, Kira. I will, Uncle. You be careful, too. I'll be waiting for everyone at Corpse Hill. Episode 5. Corpse Hill. Unable to tolerate the malicious souls surrounding the path, Kira goes on ahead to prepare for the summoning of Mrs. Stone's soul. <laughs> Kira arrived at the base of Corpse Hill fifteen minutes later. His clothes and scalp were damp from running. 
but his skin had returned to its usual color, and his eyes once again shone like emeralds. He stood on the last step of the path and studied the hill in front of him. It was wider than he had imagined, at least half a mile from end to end, and lower than Stone had described, rising only a couple dozen yards over the plain at its highest. There were no signs or walls to mark the cemetery, but the closely cramped, weathered headstones left no doubt as to the hill's function. He looked back at the path behind him, arched brows knitting close together. <sighs> Even this far along, the path still has a vile sense to it, but it's nothing compared to what I felt back there. He hoped that whatever had incited the trapped souls to thirst for blood remained confined to that area and stayed away from the cemetery itself. Focusing on the task at hand, he left the path behind, took the first few steps onto the hill, and felt nothing. It was silent and peaceful. He let out a long-held breath and felt a tension he had not been aware of ease from him. The hill was covered with a low growth of lush grass that looked silver in the full moon's light. He began scouting the surrounding area in search of Mrs. Stone's grave, and despite being pressed for time, took a few minutes to admire the intricately carved headstones, committing to memory several of the designs, so he could try to copy them in his work at the parlor. He was awed by the many generations of families that lay buried together, but he also discovered that he was envious, for the line of his family started and ended with him and his uncle. No doubt many of them have been broken apart now that Corpse Hill is avoided. It's a shame. This place is beautiful. So much history, so many memories. He now understood why Mrs. Stone had wanted it to be her final resting place. The late rains had packed down the upturned earth and ripped the petals off the withered bouquets laid over Mrs. Stone's grave. Her headstone was simple, yet elegant. A sudden thrill of anticipation overtook Kira, for he was excited at the prospect of reanimating a corpse, arisen, and about summoning its soul back from beyond what he had coined the Mirapal. He was not very skilled at dealing with souls. It could be such a nuisance, intended not to listen to him, but his dealings with the dead had been drastically limited since Sebastian had become involved, and he reveled in what he could. He didn't regret his decision to reveal himself to Saul. A few of the murdered children had found their way to his parlor, their souls broken, lost. They had wept to him who the murderer was, and despite his uncle's pleas not to get involved, he could not stay silent. The choice had cost him and Uthel their freedom, but it had saved the lives of many children. Kira didn't mind being collared by the bastion. Not really. What he didn't like was that his uncle was collared as well. It made him feel guilty, as if he had destroyed everything his uncle had worked so hard for. Kira emptied the contents of his bag onto the ground. Three glass jars, a dagger with a twisted handle, and a thin, featureless porcelain mask. Taking one of the glass jars, he opened it and spread its clumpy brown contents around the gray's perimeter. Salt infused with swing servant's blood to help keep any vile spears contained? He clicked his tongue, distressed at having to use the precious substance instead of the plain salt he normally used for summonings. Since wing serpents no longer roamed Moenda, it was nearly impossible and frightfully expensive to obtain authentic wing serpent's blood. But something had been out there on the path, and despite the seeming safety of the cemetery grounds themselves, he did not want to take any risks. After all, it's for this reason that I carry this special salt. I just never thought I would ever actually have to use it. Taking the dagger from where he had placed it on the ground, Kira called on death. It pushed out the warmth from his body and filled him with a coldness that intoxicated his every sense. Again, he took on a deathly pale, ashen appearance, and the veins that had marred his face before now spread to cover the rest of his body as well. Emerald gold eyes were replaced with the milky white orbs of the dead. <laughs> Approaching the base of Mrs. Stone's grave, Kira went down on his knees, brushed aside the tattered bouquets, and dug the fingers of his left hand into the dirt, channeling his will to the corpse that lay resting within the coffin. A trembling sigh escaped his lips as he made contact. It really has been too long since I truly interacted with the dead. He held the dagger high in the air with his right hand and tightly squeezed the spiral hilt. The steel began to glow dimly with a strange light of its own. He drove the blade into the ground near the headstone and then sliced lengthwise through the dirt down to the very foot of the grave. There was a muffled crack beneath the soil as the wooden coffin broke open. Kira reached for the thin, featureless mask and secured the leather straps. 
He didn't like having people look at him when he called upon death. Uncle says I look fine, but that's only because he's used to looking me this way. But I've seen my reflection, and even I sometimes think I look unpleasant. Kira looked down toward Mrs. Stone and called out to her. The dead hold on to secrets better than do the living, but the dead cannot hold back secrets from their master. He rose and went to greet his uncle, the agents, and Stone. It was time to begin. Episode 6, Corpse Hill, Part 2 It was always strange having people watch him summon. Kira felt clumsy, especially since he had never properly learned how it should be done. Instinct and his uncle had devised much of the ritual. The only ones who could have told him if he was doing something wrong or right were long dead. His knees had sunk slightly into the dirt as he knelt, facing the sardonyx mirror where it leaned against the headstone. Before this is over, the dirt underneath will shift the further and I'll be covered. He tugged at the mask on his face. It was secure. At his back were his uncle and Sal, the reflections distorted in the mirror's polished surface, while to his right were Tim and Stone. The two men smiled at him, their smiles weak and strained, and Stone was busy looking everywhere but at the grave. It made Kira feel embarrassed and angry. He couldn't help but feel a deep hurt and a smoldering anger when Tim looked at him in such a way, as if he should be ashamed of his actions. As a child, he had heard a rhyme about deadbringers, a silly rhyme to scare children, that never failed to come to mind when he saw the agent's reaction. One, one by, by one, one, the deadbringers dead came, came bringing with them their dolls, dolls to play. Will your, your strings be cut? cut, cut, cut Not on this day. The dolls have found someone else to maim. <laughs> Ignoring them as best he could, Kira took the dagger and dragged the edge across the length of his palm. Blood welled up within his cupped hand to fall to the ground, and he pressed his bleeding hand against the dirt, calling sternly to Mrs. Stone. Come to me. He felt the sharp edges grab at her as she pushed her way through the fractured wood of the casket and the weight of the dirt crashed down all around her. He could feel the graininess of the dirt that found its way into the crevices of her body and pulled at her weak flesh, tearing bits away. Their flesh was cold. Their flesh was marred. But they would soon be whole again. He ran his fingers down his neck, reveling in the cold embrace that caressed every inch of him. We've waited long enough. Kira thrust his arm into the shifting dirt and grabbed onto Mrs. Stone, bringing her out of darkness and up into the moonlight. Vacant eye sockets and a face of rotted flesh greeted him. A white gown, sullied and tattered, clung to her body. Her flesh was discolored and bloated in many places where the moist, cold weather had kept her from desiccating, and her joints creaked and flesh protested as she knelt before him. The overwhelming smell of rot and wet dirt filled the air. He reached for one of the jars and opened it, revealing pasty, flesh-colored fiber clay. Tenderly drawing Mrs. Stone close to him, he took the fiber clay and spread a portion of it on her face. Her skin wept with moisture at the pressure exerted upon it and an inhuman, guttural noise came from her throat. <laughs> Gently, he began easing his fingers into her face, his touch decomposing flesh and clay alike, the thick liquid trailing down his arms. Kira was elated, yet at the same time deeply saddened that it was only the dead that he could touch directly without fear. If I ever lie with someone, will they rot beneath me? It was a fear that kept him up on the restless nights when he longed to have someone to call his own. A bony hand reached to touch his chest, and he smiled behind his mask at the skull staring up at him. Closing his eyes, he let his fingers slip further in and focused on molding the flesh clay mixture by pouring some of his own life energy into her. He began at the temporal bone, running his hands down the mandible and expertly gathering the excess clumps of decaying flesh to mold elsewhere on her face. Normally, he relied on the shape and features of the skull to reveal the face's appearance, but Mrs. Stone's skull had been fractured, her face distorted. He would not expose her soul to even more suffering by confronting her with the brutality of her disfigurement. He molded on instinct, feeling for the echo of her absent soul that he knew was imprinted in the very marrow of her bones. As her face began to take shape, he channeled more energy into her and watched as her body filled out, becoming supple, even curvy. 
A longing sigh escaped his lips. <sighs> it had been far too long since he had flexed this much power over the dead, and even longer since he had molded flesh. It was done. Kira stared down at the very image he had seen in his mind's eye made real. A woman of soft features and luscious lips, a far younger woman than Mrs. Stone had been. He cupped her face, ran his thumbs down to her dainty chin, and lifted her head. He lowered his face to hers until her heart-shaped lips touched the mask. Without it, their lips would have met. His voice was deep, far deeper than anyone who knew him could have thought possible, as he whispered, You are mine. I am your master. Regardless of the soul that inhabits this body, you belong to me. Your free will I will not take from you, but know that it is only so because I allow it. Engrave these words to your heart, mind, body, and make it known to the soul that enters. He stood, helping her stand once again on her own two feet. He took her arm in his and guided her to the sardonyx mirror. She faced her reflection. Kira used the dagger to reopen the wound on his palm, which had already begun to knit, and pressed it against the surface of the mirror. Smooth stone phased from solid to liquid that undulated outward to the vermeulaced border like a pool of blood. He had begun moving Mrs. Stone closer to the mirror when she abruptly wheeled about, pressing her face against his chest. Her slender fingers pulled at his vest, popping off the ivory stick pin that held the high collar together. Surprised, he grabbed her by the neck, forcing her struggling body against the rippling mirror. Slowly, her struggling subsided. Soon, she would truly be Mrs. Stone. But until her soul was returned to her, she was only arisen, a mindless, reanimated corpse. Or, at least, that was the little he thought he knew. No risen had ever struggled against him like she had. He ran his fingers up and down the small of her back, trying to decipher the emotions swarming him. Blood from his palm dripped down onto her gown, forming red blossoms. A strong desire to possess her, to care for her, flooded him, a feeling more akin to the need to cherish one's creation than a sexual one. He had never felt such a strong urge to keep arisen from its own soul. He pressed his cut hand against the livid stone and peered intently into it. The mirror, Paul. Amazing mirrors. And within some of these mirrors are traces of her soul. I need to focus. His eyes darted from one direction to another on the mirror. But more than sight, he used his connection to the risen at his side to track what he sought. Found them. His hand slipped quickly into the mirror. With his blood, he cast threads into the labyrinth beyond and bound the pieces of Mrs. Stone's soul. Then... Grabbing on to the threads of blood, he pulled them out. He severed the link between the realm of the living and the mirror pall with his dagger, and the mirror was once again nothing more than solid stone. He wrapped the threads around her body and faced her. It's time for you to return, Mrs. Stone. There was a sudden shift in her posture as her head jerked up toward Kira and then toward her reflection in the mirror. As he ran the last of the weaves around her, he bent down and whispered into her ear the reason she had been summoned. There was a flash of silence as Mrs. Stone examined the faces surrounding her, then a terrified scream as she recognized her son. <coughs> Episode 7 Reign of Blood <coughs> It happened so fast like a foul wind that had been lying in wait to attack at just the right moment. Kataru! Tim stepped just out of reach as a sword forged from the blood that had welled from Stone's wrist cut at him. Tim caught the downward strike with the axe head, stopping the blow. <laughs> You're in my way. The Kataro that had been Stone slipped the blood sword's point down past the axe into Tim's neck. <laughs> Tim used the last of his strength to swing the axe's bit deep into Stone's side and then crumbled onto the ground. The Kataro stumbled, but remained standing. He pulled the axe free and reached for the bleeding wound in his side, but Sal was upon him before he could touch it. Get Kira out of here! The Kataru ripped at one of the layers of his clothing, exposing a fine powder that tumbled out onto his hand. Before Sal could respond, he touched the powder to the blood seeping around his wound and threw it at her. <sighs> she flung up her arm to shield her eyes from the flax that dug into her face like sharp glass. 
the Kataro moved in to kill, but Uthal sprang forward, parrying the forceful blow with his short sword. Without warning, Sal collapsed, and the Kataru withdrew, putting ample space between them. Uthal put a finger to Sal's neck, her pulse weak. In that brief moment, the Kataru wheeled about and hurled a small object to Kira, who was making for Tim's axe. The object penetrated his lower torso, but he continued onwards, determined. Ah. Kira's determination was cut short as his side ruptured obscenely, and he went reeling to his knees, blood and entrails spilling onto the ground. Ah. Uthal's agony ripped through the night. The Kataru drew another of the objects and took aim. He means to fell me as he did Kira. Kira! Then a small figure charged from behind the Kataru. It was Mrs. Stone. She flung herself onto the Kataru's back, clawing at his face, causing him to drop the object which exploded at his feet. Chavil be damned! Uthal ran to Kira, his boots splashing in the growing pool of blood. He still breathes, but is losing too much blood. He looked behind him. The Kataru had peeled Mrs. Stone off of him and was cruelly beating her to the ground smashing her skull and breaking her neck with his sword's pummel. I need to end this. I, I cannot lose. Uthal moved swiftly away from Kira and the fallen bodies of the agents. The Kataru followed. He spoke, his voice sounding nothing like Stone's fawning tone from before. You hate me. Good. Do me a favor. Put up more of a challenge. You knew who we were. The Bastion has betrayed us to the Ascendancy, and broken its oath to leave us be. <laughs> no, my clever doll. It was fortune who delivered you to me. I am no doll. If you say so, you're waiting for me to make the first move, my clever doll. Very well. Let us make this a battle worthy of song. The Kataru moved forward, striking, and Uthal fell back, desperately trying to keep beyond reach. His opponent was being careful not to swing his sword into the ground or a headstone. Uthal needed an opening, so he made his own. He jumped back and stooped to pick a rock bigger than his hand. As the Kataru's sword swung past, he darted toward a large, ornate statue, taking cover behind it. The Kataru stopped his advance, waiting for him to emerge. Uthal feigned exiting from the right side of the statue, then whirled back to the left side and threw the rock at the Kataru. It flew true, and as the Kataru dodged, Uthal deftly leapt around the right side again and charged, closing the gap between them. He managed to thrust the dagger into the Kataru's shoulder, twisted it, and then brought forward the short sword to cut at the wound made earlier by Tim. Uthal pulled the dagger out and whirled about, leaping away to avoid the Kataru's sword. But instead of the sword, a foot-long dart flew at him from nowhere, piercing his heart. <laughs> Uthal stumbled back and tried to pull the dart out, but the barbs tore at his palm. I must push the dart clean through. <coughs> cannot pull out the dart without tearing my heart. Uh -huh. My blood is my weapon. I hope you're enjoying the dart I fashioned just for you. You're quite the tenacious doll. Pierce the heart. Fell the doll, the old saying goes, but not you. Oh, not you. My heart is pierced, yet I stand. I am no doll. I will not lose him as I lost you. I will not. With the loss of your head, your strings will be cut. And all that will be left is a broken doll to play with. As for your master, all I want are the eyes. Like emerald flames with the burning gold of the sun dancing behind them, your head and his eyes will make exquisite trophies. Think. 
Breathe. Move. Ignoring the pain, Kira lifted his head as high as he could and scanned the cemetery. The guitar was alive, and Uthal was alive, but his hand was bloodied and something was sticking out of his chest. Kira's vision blurred and his body gave out, his head crashing back to the moist, red ground. Bile spilled from his mouth and dripped down the side of his chin, spreading underneath his cheek. It smelled foul. Alive. Alive. Breathe. His eyes shot open. The retching expulsion had nearly caused him to black out, but he needed to stay conscious. He tried to dig his fingers into the ground, but they would not respond. He wanted to laugh. The muscles required to do so were no longer his. Blood. So much. Mine. They're all mine. Come to me. The smell of fresh soil and raw engulfed him, and the cemetery came alive. Tim rose, but Sal did not. From afar, Kira heard screams of rage and the sound of mournful laughter. So sad. Please don't be. He felt something rest against his arm. Her face was crushed, unrecognizable, but he could feel that it was Mrs. Stone. She pressed against him, and he knew that she was asking him to take back into himself the life he had given her. He did as she bid, and his mind swam even as a little strength flowed back into him, and her body fell, a mere corpse once more. He had brought Mrs. Stone back only to suffer more. He had brought those he called friends to death. Eye for an eye. The thoughts feverishly racing through his mind would have frightened him at any other time, but he was dancing the line between life and death, between sanity and insanity. Kira issued a silent command to the risen of Corpse Hill. I want his flesh. I want his life. I want him pinned down to the ground like a small frightened animal. Take him. Make him yours. Kill him. Episode 8 Sleep How is Sal? Kira is so still. All that moves is his chest, and even that is barely noticeable. It has been three days now, and the fever has not yet broken. I need more towels to catch the pus weeping onto the bed. You weren't listening, were you? No, sorry. Please, tell me again, while I make a poultice for Kira. The healers say that Sal is in a coma, but I have to think there is some poison at work. What led you to that conclusion? You told me that you saw a stone fling something at her, and she fell without explanation. My healer said she must have been struck on the head, yet you said stone never struck her. I've seen many wounded warriors before, but this is different somehow. The healers have tried everything, and still she lies with her eyes closed, her breathing slow. I don't know what to do anymore. Come morning, the sheet will be threadbare, but I can use nothing else until the fever subsides. In this state, you have control of nothing. Please come back to me. Please. That Kataru made fools of us all. But Kira had the last laugh. What really happened at Corpse Hill? I already told you. The Kataru claimed he sought us of his own will, but he knew who we were. We were betrayed. And what will your noble bastion think of its pet now that it has seen what it can do? Kira summoned scores of risen in the cemetery? Alone? He paid for it in blood and almost... And maybe yet. 
with his life. He then directed the Risen to slaughter Stone. Who was a skin stealer who attacked him. And you are the only person alive to vouch for that fact. Sal knows. God damn you, Yatu. You think this has been easy for me? I lost my baby, and now my partner may never wake up. I lost a good man who left behind a partner and a child. That bastion is in an uproar. The Ascendancy has learned of your existence and is threatening to send sanctifiers. And I'm the one trying to keep shit from getting worse. If you haven't noticed, I'm on your side. <laughs> How fortunate that we have such a champion. Pshh. I have always hated the word champion. It tends to conjure visions of grandeur and self-sacrifice, but no one sacrifices anything unless that can get something back in return. <sighs> the problem is Stone. To prove your story, you would have to show that the real Stone had been killed and his skin stolen. Caterers are common enough in the North, but skin stealing is an incredibly rare ability, even among the older clans in the South, and only an elite warrior could have done the damage he did. Since there's not much left of his body, there's no way to tell what he was. Worse still, Stone's sister and partner claim there was nothing abnormal about him. You have only to lend credence to your words. And you are the only one who was not injured. The Bastion does not trust me. You wouldn't be having this problem if you had accepted my offer to become an agent. I feel like I feel we're like playing we're a playing game of game cat and cat mouse, mouse, with neither, with neither of us wanting to be the mouse. mouse. Tell me, honestly... What is the Bastion planning to do with us? Many are calling for Kira's death and your imprisonment. I'm trying to make my fellow council members see that you would be more valuable alive, and as agents, under my command, if possible. But I doubt my words carry much weight these days. And then after all of this... Describe Sal's appearance to me. Sal lies as Kira lies, never moving, hardly breathing. Her skin is pale almost gray. I move her body from side to side to avoid sores, but her skin is breaking down even so, and her limbs are becoming stiff. Her pink limbs are almost black. I don't know what to do. I don't want to lose her. I have some skill in making healing potions. Why didn't you mention this before? Because my skill is nothing compared to that of a competent healer. And I am sure that you have the services of the best. But who knows? I might be able to succeed where they have not. I see no reason to not try. For both your Sal and my Kira. And if Sal should waken? Then you will give credit to the healers, of course. Agreed. Can you really guarantee the Bastion will be placated by Sal's validation of my words? No, I can guarantee nothing. But if Sal wakes, it will afford us some time. Maybe time enough to let tempers cool. Very well. I am done redressing Kira's wounds. Follow me, and do not trail behind. Don't forget the lantern. Unlike yours, my eyes aren't suited for the darkness. Ah, yes. Bell. Lado. Pen. Sit. Lado. Sit. These are wood rats, right? Yes. They are my beauties. The smallest is Belle, the one closest to her is Pen, and the one looking innocent is Lado. I do not have to explain to you why I have been keeping them away from Kira. No, you don't. I've never seen a wood rat this close. They're very secretive, but I see why you call them your beauties. Has Sal ever seen them? No, but when Sal wakes up, she can meet them. You sound so sure that she will wake. Do I have a choice? <laughs> no. This way. This is my room. If you could, please help me light the lanterns. It will make the room more comfortable for you while you wait. And yes, it is rather disorderly. <laughs> You're always so well dressed and downstairs is so overtly clean. It is refreshing to see that your room isn't. I am as presentable as I need to be in my line of work. Enough. Where is Sal now? At home. An agent is watching over her while I'm away. Good. There is mint water and wine on the nightstand. Help yourself. I will start making the healing potion. I saw that you added your blood. Why? The potion is of moon water. 
crushed eyelicked bone and venom, Delora root, and various other things. I use my blood because all potions are at their strongest, when the blood of the one making them is used. But enough chatter. Ride quickly and without stopping, for this potion must be administered within the hour, or it loses its efficacy. If the inky black color changes, do not give it to her. It should work almost immediately, if not. Mm. Thank you. Make sure she drinks it all, or else Sal may fall back to sleep. I will. Thank you, Yatu. Episode 9, A Chance Encounter Kira stood in front of a plain white door. He blinked, and curls of white paint slowly peeled away in jagged, disjointed patterns. His mind conjured images of someone trying desperately to claw a way out, and he tore his eyes away with a shudder. Looking around, he saw he stood in a narrow, misshapen hallway that seemed to have no end. He began to walk, but despite the feeling of motion, he was unable to move away from the white door. Standing in silence, a thought pierced his foggy mind. This is a dream. Desperate, he closed his eyes, pushed out the image of the door and hallway, and envisioned himself awake. But he didn't know where awake was. Uncle? Where am I? Where are you? Did we go somewhere? Panicking, he opened his eyes and saw he was no longer in the hallway. Instead, he found himself in a large square room that was empty, save for a single row of ornate, gilt-framed paintings and mirrors lining each of the four walls. He caught sight of his reflection in one of the mirrors and saw that he was masked and garbed in the attire he would typically wear to summon the dead. A sudden sensation of familiarity of something urgent pricked at his mind, but was quickly replaced with an unwilling curiosity as he was pulled by an overwhelming need to look at the paintings. Morbid fascination took him from one to the next. The images were grotesque, debaucherous, and though each wall showcased a different focus, all were nonetheless joined by a common theme. Torture. Torture of mind. Torture of body, torture of soul. A cold numbness plagued his side, and again he found his mind wandering as if it were desperately trying to recall something. Then a gilt frame glinted, and Kira refocused his attention on the painting before him. A tableau of a bound, naked man being pulled apart by two horses. He wondered if the gruesome image had brought about the unpleasant sensation in his side. The man's anguish look contrasted sharply with the ecstatic grins of the riders mounted atop the horses. To his horror, the skin around the naked man's waist and limbs slowly began to tear as the horses and their riders moved further apart. The painting was alive. It won't be long now. The man will soon be dead, and the riders will have their fill. Kira stiffened his heart racing, and turned in the direction of the voice. He was surprised to discover that it belonged to a woman taller than him. It has been a long time since I had a guest. Kira tried to focus. For some reason, he could not make out her features, except for her intense, nearly black eyes. Is this a dream? For most, yes. But for you, not quite. What does that mean, not quite? The woman circled around Kira as she spoke, her eyes focusing intently on his side. Individuals, Individuals who harbor unfulfilled desires find their way to my hallway. Depending, depending on what they, they seek, they may be offered, may be offered the, opportunity the opportunity to fulfill, fulfill the impossibilities they crave. Kira's cheeks flushed underneath his mask. He was grateful his features were concealed. Some, not all but some. Find reality disdainful and seek escape in dreams instead of embracing the waking world they live in. But, more to the point, this room is cut off from the hallway and belongs specifically to me. No one has ever entered this room until now. She continued circling Kira, peering at him as if he were some oddity. Alarmed, he retreated to one of the walls, 
putting his back against it to prevent the woman from walking around him. The paintings on the wall are insights into some of the more entertaining desires. Do these kinds of desires entertain you? Everyone, including you, restrains infinite longings they feel ashamed of. In some, those desires are violent, and mutual satisfaction through intimacy is nothing more than an illusion. Often, it escapes into their lives, destroying them. But it's an abyss to which they have willingly submitted, although it often drags in others not willing. So now, I ask, what are you seeking? Her voice rang like black metal, and the question she posed echoed in Kira's ears, while a sudden pain in his side, sharp and deep, caused his knees to buckle and his vision to go dark. Again a memory prickled at the edge of his mind, but disappeared before he could take hold of it. Finally, pain subsiding, he straightened up and found that the woman was gone, and he was in front of another door, this one made of rusted metal. Shadows flickered madly across its surface. Kira turned and found that the shadows came from a solitary candle burning brightly on a table in the middle of the room. In contrast to the last, this room was smaller and the walls were completely barren, but it was dim, and the floor was covered with barely visible objects. He stepped forward, but something crunched under his boot, causing him to jump back in alarm. What? He stooped to touch a long piece of what appeared to be porcelain. His eyes traveled up the length of its body to its face, and two shiny, glass bead eyes. A doll? Kira removed his gloves, dropped to his knees, and eagerly reached out to touch the smooth, cold face looking lifelessly back at him. Even through the flickering shadows, he could make out the perfect ringlets, the delicate features of her face, the strong curves of her naked, lifelike body. She was softly beautiful. He blushed profusely as he examined her construction, but frustration soon trumped all other emotions. He could normally see so well in the dark, but the dim lighting seemed made of a living darkness that blinded him, making it difficult to determine how the doll had been put together. <laughs> you know what she is, don't you? Why are you so enthused with my pets? Did you make her? How important is that answer to you? Or you a dead bringer? <laughs> Snide laughter erupted from the mouth of the porcelain doll, followed quickly by <laughs> mocking laughter from the woman herself. The sounds echoed from every corner of the room, seemingly coming from the very shadows themselves. Kira dropped the doll and stepped away, his back hitting something. Before he could react, sharp metal tips from a claw-ringed hand were pressed against his throat. Her deep voice whispered in his ear. Would it, Would it please, please you if I was, was a dead bringer? Kira's mind swam. Were the claw tips pressed against his neck poisoned? Was she alive? Did you kill her? Everything that is dead once lived, and everything that lives came from nothingness. That isn't an answer. But it is. The woman brought her face mere inches from Kira's own, intently studying the outline of his mask. All amusement disappeared from her voice. You should, you should not, not be, be here. here. What, what are, are you? you? What, what am I? It seemed like a question he should have asked the moment the woman had first appeared, but fatigue claimed him before he could answer, and he collapsed. Kira felt the woman catch him. Through nearly closed eyes, he watched as the porcelain mask concealing his face fell to the ground and fractured into two halves. <laughs> Claw-ringed fingers brushed the hair away from his face and turned him over. Shock, bewilderment, a fading voice. Unable to make out the woman's words, Kira let sleep take him. Episode 10, Revelations, Part 1 Kira, Kira, are you awake? Uncle... I have waited so long to see your eyes open and remain open, uh, to have you look at me and recognize me. Water. Drink slowly. How long? Hmm. Two weeks. Is Sal alive? 
Sal lives. She was in a coma, but Kim sent word several days ago that his healers were able to wake her. She is recovering, same as you. We can speak later. For now, you should rest. I raised the dead in the cemetery. I used them to kill stone. You did what you had to do. You were left with no other option. Now rest. The dead tore Mr. Stone apart. With their teeth, their hands, they, they feasted on his flesh, his blood, and I felt every second of it as if it had been me doing it. And I reveled in it. You... You had lost too much blood at that point. You were no longer in control. But I was in control. And when his blood coursed down my throat, I felt his life flow into me. And I didn't tell the dead to stop, because I knew in that moment that stealing his life would keep me alive. I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know. Kira, stop. You are weak and spouting nonsense. I don't regret stealing his life, and I don't regret directing the dead to slaughter him. What I regret is not having acted sooner to save Tim, to protect Sal and you. Prop Mrs. Stone back so she could relive her nightmare. Uncle, your chest. I saw something pierce your chest. Enough. You did what you had to do to stay alive. I am alive. Sal is alive. Tim is dead, but that is not your fault. They were agents, and they knew the risks. Now, you were able to raise a cemetery of corpses because you almost paid with your life. Such a feat cannot be repeated otherwise. Do you understand? As for what you experienced, speak of this to no one. Not your dear Elia, not Sal, not Kim, not your shadow. No one. Do you understand? Yes. Sleep. I will stay here by your side. Come morning, I will change the bandages and help you bathe and eat. I will kill one of the chickens and make a broth from its bones. I am not sure you can eat solid food at the present time. But you can still appreciate. Kira closed his eyes and listened to the sound of his uncle's voice. And it will do you good. And he felt safe. Here. Come what may, I will protect my uncle. With that promise, he drifted off into a dreamless sleep. Everything will be all right. It was just a simple bath. I smelled awful. And you would have smelled worse if the wound had festered. What is Etau feeding you? Air? and I've started eating meat. Undo your shirt. I want to take a look at this knife wound that your uncle claims you suffered. Do I have to? The bandages, too. Now. Fine. Knife wound. <laughs> your uncle is a bad liar. No wonder he told me nothing about this. Feels better than it looks, really. My uncle cleans and changes the dressing every day. He shovels as much food into me as I can hold without becoming sick and makes me walk in short spurts throughout the day so my muscles don't wither. Are you taking anything for when you do have pain? Nologis. But I don't need her anymore. Ilya, is something wrong? Nologis is a powerful root. It's stronger than poppy. I don't like it, but my uncle insists that I take it. It must be difficult for a dead bringer to control his abilities under the influence of such a root. Does the rest of Opalin say no? Do you hate me? Foolish boy, how could I? How long have you known? Since you were little. I was gathering herbs one day in the forest across the Silver River, and I saw you bent down, talking to the remains of some poor forsaken child. It's just... What's wrong? And don't tell me nothing. And don't say it's because you learned that I'm a deadbringer, because you already knew that. Please, tell me. My partner was a dead bringer. My children were dead bringers, too. I... I didn't know. The Ascendancy knew my partner was a dead bringer, and they took me captive to gather information. The pain that I endured was nothing compared to the all-consuming dread that the Ascendancy would return with news they had found my children and their father. I had managed to convince myself that as long as they returned to question me, my family was safe. <laughs> the day my eyes saw the light once more was also the day I knew in my heart that I would never see my family again. 
Thank you for sharing something so personal with me. I wish the purging had never happened, but you're not alone. You have me. Kira, why is that man here? Who? That head agent, that LaFont. Kim is a friend, as is his partner Sal. Promise me you're not lying. Promise me the Bastion, the Ascendancy, the Sanctifiers, that they know nothing about you. To them I'm Karen Vidal, mortician and headstone carver. Only that. Nothing more. Yes, you are Kira Vidal. Just Kira Vidal. Episode 11, Revelations Part 2. Sal is awake. And now how you do thank for that, Yatu? How's Kira? You never said a word about his health. I knew you would eventually come back. So I saw no need. It was good news to both of us to hear that Sal is recovering. That the coma did not have any lasting effects. As for Kira, he too is recovering. Though he is still weak. Was it wise to let that old woman into your home? Elia is an old friend and is aware of what Kira's touch can do. Of him being a dead-bringer, she knows nothing. Besides, pushing her away would have made her suspicious and caused more trouble. She is quite stubborn concerning Kira. A dangerous gamble. But I suppose you're no stranger to the concept. Anyone who would task themselves with the responsibility of raising a dead-bringer child as their own would have to be willing to risk it all. Yet you never struck me as a paternal type. Though you would do anything to keep Hira safe, you must have loved his mother greatly. Of course I loved her. She was my sister. I suppose Kira must look like her then, or perhaps like his father. I had never been able to find much of a resemblance between the two of you. I presume that Kira resembles his father. You presume? She was your sister, and you don't know who sired the child? She was my sister, not my property. Your blood is rather amazing. The blood was only one of the ingredients in the potion, and it was merely to bind it together. I'm sure you confirmed with your healers that I spoke truthfully about the importance of using the Maker's blood in a potion. Yes, I'm sure the other ingredients in the potion must have been first-rate, but it was your blood that woke her. Your point, Lafont. Does Kira know? Or have you treated him as a fool, like you treated me? I know not what you are insinuating, but your gratitude for my saving your partner is so very much appreciated. Now, please leave. I can take Elia back to the old town myself. Is it so hard for you to admit what you are? And what, pray tell, do you think I am? A doll. <laughs> oh, is that it? I've never known you to jest, but you picked a poor one to start with. A jest, is it? Not according to my spellcaster. <laughs> oh, yes, Yatu. Did you really think I would only have simple healers look at my precious Sal? As her life waned, I obtained the services of a spellcaster. And she told me that Sal was not in a true coma, but instead was in a grasp of a sleeping spell. And not any spell, but a very special type. One designed during the purging to capture dolls and dead bringers. You know the one, I'm sure. The spell whose victims can only be revived by the blood of a doll. What do you want? You're different than any doll I have ever seen. Unique. I had now and again entertained the suspicion that you might be a doll. But you're so lifelike that I did not believe it. And I did not truly believe your potion would heal Sal. When she opened her eyes, my joy was mixed with shock. But Kira cannot possibly be your maker. He is far too young to craft something so... alive. Was his father your maker? No. How did you come by Kira? Did you make him yourself from some fallen dead bringer's arms? If you're alive, then your master must be as well. No doll can survive long once its master is killed. Are you hoping for another pet? Dead bringer, I can see the greed in your eyes. This isn't about me. You should tell Kira what you are before he figures out that his beloved uncle is nothing more than a puppet who is skilled at weaving lies. Like you once did. 
Kira believes I am just another MoMA. There are no more dead bringers left. There are no more dolls. All he has to go by is what scant literature remains that was not destroyed during the purging. <laughs> and in those pages, the history of the dead bringers was distorted and rewritten to justify their genocide. Kira has no idea what a real doll is, nor will he ever. Do you have so little faith in Kira? Get out! For your sake and Kira's, you need to tell him the truth. You need to trust him. Get out, or I will gut you. Very well. But before I leave, you should know that Sal has corroborated your story about what happened at the Corpse Hill, but, unlike me, our superiors remain skeptical. They insist on a hearing to listen to Kira's account of what happened before deciding whether to believe you. And if Kira fails to entertain, what then? Then Kira will be executed, or handed over to the Ascendancy as a gesture of our continued good faith. Here's the letter for the summons. You will have to forgive my lack of gratitude. Tell me, does the Bastion know about your great discovery of my true nature? No, nor will they. That is my gratitude for what you did for Sal. <sighs> when is the hearing? Seven days from now. Until then, both of you are to remain under house arrest. Already, as we have spoken here, armed agents have taken their place to stand guard outside your house. What tale have you woven to keep the good people of Opulance from fretting? It's well known that before you took this house for your own, it belonged to a rogue Roarden. That Roarden has returned and attacked Kira. Since this matter falls under Bastion jurisdiction, we are sending agents to guard you from any further attacks. I do not appreciate having been deceived. Nor do I like being bottled up inside my own house without warning. To make amends, you could at least confirm my suspicion. Does Sal know how you tricked me? That you used her sickness to discover who I am? Yes, she knows. Sal realized soon after waking that the healers were shocked at her recovery and that something was amiss. It didn't take her long to wring the truth from me. Sal was not very happy with me. Good. Call that old woman here so we can leave together. I will tell you the story about the Roarden myself. Additional agents will arrive before the sun sets. You can see yourself out. Itao looked out the window as Kim and Elia set out. Kim on his mare and Elia on her mule. He went upstairs to check on Kira and found him sleeping. <sighs> I need to show him this letter. He crumbled the letter in his hand and made his way to his own room where he locked the door behind him. Walking over to the nightstand, he poured himself a glass of wine and retrieved from his pocket a pea-sized nub of Nogalus, which he swallowed to quell the creeping pain in his heart. He was watching Belle and her friend run around in their cage while Kim's words overtook him. Do you have, you have so, so little, little faith, faith in Kira? Itao covered his mouth to stifle a cry and let the tears he had been holding in stream down his face. In the silence of his room, Itao fell to his knees and wept. Episode 12, Time, Part 1 Our guests are quite somber. But I suppose I would be as well if I had to spend my days walking in circles around a house. I still can't believe Kim believes the Bastion might turn on us. It's a good thing he told you. When are we leaving? Soon. When I have found a pattern to the agent's movements, they have been careful. Do you have what you need, packed and ready to go? Yeah, but can we wait until the Bastion makes a decision? Kim has always been on Kira, everything is different now. We can no longer rely on Kim's status to keep us safe. I should have known better than to linger in one place for this long. It was an absurd thing to do. No, it wasn't. You just tried to give me a place to call home, and I ruined all your efforts. I'm sorry. <sighs> Perhaps it is better this way. I don't see how this is better. But is there any way to see Ilya before we leave? No. And for her sake, you must never see her again. I know how much you love Ilya, but you must let her go. It's not that easy. There has to be a Look way. Look at me. 
You must not be afraid of change, and you must not fail to act when your life is in danger. Make no mistake. If you wish to live, you must accept that you will have to kill. The Kataru at Corpse Hill will not be the last. Okay, fine. I won't see Ilya. But then at least tell me if what happened with the dead and the skin stealer was something you have seen before. I already told you that I have not. Why do I feel like you're hiding something from me? And why is it that you always try to find five legs on a cat when it has four? Probably because whenever I ask you questions about dead bringers or dolls, you get upset. And why are we in this mess? Because I'm a dead bringer. No, you are Kira Vidal of Opulance, son of my late sister. You are a mortician, a stone carver, and a boy who only half listens to what I say. So I ask again, why are we in this mess? Because I insist on being recognized as a dead bringer. <sighs> when I told you that you were a dead bringer, I did not expect you to take it to heart, but you did. After that, I made a promise to myself that I would fill the need I had planted in your heart. I promised that I would make you forget that you were a dead bringer so you would not feel alone. I only ever wanted you to be Kira, just Kira. But how do you love without being selfish? How? Uncle, I... Ita, open up. It's important. I promise I'm not here to take Kira away. It's Sal. Wait. Quickly, gather your travel bags and go wait for me in my room. But we don't even know why she's here. Please do as I say. If all is well, I will fetch you. What about you? Unlike you, I have no injury to worry about. Now, go and get Belle and the others ready. Just in case. I'll be waiting. Be careful. Tell, open up! Open up! I heard you. Give me a moment. There's not much time. I think the Ascendancy is on its way. And not just regular soldiers, sanctifiers. Where are they? When will they arrive? There have been rumors of sanctifiers roaming about the north for weeks now. But last night, a group was spotted a day's ride away, heading towards Opulence. If the sanctifiers demand Kira be handed over to them, I will send an escort to see you out of Opulence. It's my shame to admit that there are too many in the Bastion who would rather see Kira dead than relinquish him to the Ascendancy. And Kim, what does he plan to do? Does he know you are here? Why are you here? I cannot believe he or you would just let us go free. As for why, you saved my life, although it costs you dearly, and I don't forget such things. I will not see you or Kira killed, not by Sanctifiers or the Bastion. But no, Kim doesn't know I'm here. The rest of the Bastion, even those who want Kira dead, will be in an uproar when they learn that the Ascendancy has butted into their territory without leave. Also, for my sake, I need you to put on a good show. What kind of show? The best kind. The kind that keeps my name from being associated with treason? Agent, come over here! Yes, Colonel Sim. Mr. Vidal is being insubordinate. Now, I'll ask you one more time. The Bastion wants to hear your testimony about what happened that night at Corpse Hill. If you don't come with us now, it won't go well for you. I will not leave Kira alone. You've been given an order. And you have my answer. I had hoped you'd be more cooperative. Agent, I need everyone to stay vigilant this night. It looks like a storm is coming, and I don't want our wards to believe they can do something foolish. Alone, Uthal punched the wall next to him until the wood cracked and blood ran down his knuckles. <sighs> there was no remorse in his voice as he took hold of the lanterns in the foyer and emptied their oil onto the floor. Our time here has come to an end. Episode 13, Time, Part 2. Sal says that the Sanctifiers are heading our way. Sanctifiers? Why? <sighs> My question exactly. But why does not matter. We are leaving tonight. Neither of us stands a chance against them. 
Uthal walked over to one of the bookcases and, grabbing onto a shelf, pulled. Books and glass jars toppled over onto the floor as the bookcase inched away from the wall. A secret passage? Why don't you ever tell me about this? I had hoped we would never have to use it. Are you still thinking of writing to the Gauntspears? Only as a last resort. Now gather your things, and hand me the cage with the wood rats. What will happen to the house? Even as we speak, it is burning. This was our home, and I will not have anyone else use it. Come now. We have to hurry through the tunnel before the smoke and flames become visible. We're underground. Yes. This passageway leads directly to the stables. From what I was able to observe of the agent's activity, there is usually only one of them stationed there. I hope I am not mistaken. Um... I... I made four rat dolls to help us escape. One I sent to stand guard inside the stables. The other two I sent to chew on the agent's saddle belts once you told me we were leaving. The last I sent to the highest point of the house to keep watch and alert me the moment I saw anyone heading our way. Can you see how many guards are in the stable? Only one. Very well. Have your... rat... distract him so I can get through the trap door. The agent, who had taken to resting against one of the beams, was not prepared for the rat that sprang at his face, biting and clawing. He peeled it off and threw it to the ground, spearing it with his sword. But as he did so, Uthal covered the agent's mouth with one hand and slit his throat. The man thrashed about, but Uthal held on firm, not letting go until he ceased to move. You didn't have to kill him. He was one of Kim's men. Do you not remember that I told you killing might be necessary? That is one less agent to fret about. Now fasten the saddlebags while I set the stable aflame. Ah! Fire! The second the agents pushed open the stable doors, Uthal and Kira burst out at a gallop and rode into the storm the frigid rain pelting against them like tiny rocks. Lightning snaked wildly to the ground, and thunder boomed as if to crack the very sky. Recovering from their initial confusion, the agents ran to their horses and mounted. Two succeeded and began the pursuit, but two others fell heavily to the muddy ground as their saddle straps broke. Amid the chaos, two rat dolls scurried away in the waterfall of rain. As Kira rode, he used his powers to look through the eyes of the rat doll, posted on guard on top of the burning house. Through thick smoke and approaching flames, he saw a small group of horsemen clad in black riding to meet him from the east, the very direction in which they were fleeing. Not wanting the rat doll to suffer, he set it free and felt its life disappear. The sanctifiers are in pursuit. They're in front of us. Damn it! I know a better path to take. Follow me. Where are you going? Trust me. Uthel caught sight of something hurtling toward him and ducked low over his horse's neck, just as a crossbow bolt flew past. The change in direction had favored the agents and allowed them to gain ground. As the first agent closed in, Uthel hurled his dagger. His blade wobbled through the air and connected with the agent's shoulder, throwing him off balance. Before he could recover, Uthel kicked his horse into a gallop and was upon him, plunging a short sword into the agent's neck. Uthal dropped his arm to let the first body slide off his blade, and then wheeled his horse about to find the second agent, the one with the crossbow, desperately reloading. But then the crossbow man's movement suddenly ceased. His eyes went glassy, and he slumped forward and out of his saddle, a knife jutting from his neck. Directly behind was Kira, his long hair plastered across his face from the rain. He dismounted and retrieved not only his blade, but the body as well, which he draped over the pommel of his saddle. Nightmare lords, take me. Are those the sanctifiers I see in the distance? Kira sprang for his horse, even as Uthal wasted time on only one word. Ride! Uthal and Kira rode without looking back, afraid that the mere act would somehow bring their pursuers closer. A low wall made of piled stones came into view, and Kira let out a sigh of relief. Beyond the wall, tall stalks of grass swayed violently in the wind, and blazed as lightning set the land of fire and white heat. The horses neighed and swung their heads as they galloped onto Corpse Road, threatening to turn back, but they spurred them onward without mercy. They were only a few hundred yards along the road when a sharp pain seized Kira, nearly knocking him off his horse. 
A wave of nausea overtook him as the wailing screams of trapped souls demanding blood tore at him like whips lacerating his flesh. He turned in his seat to look back, horror filling his eyes as the lightning lit up the sky. The sanctifiers entered Corpse Road in single file, trotting slowly, apparently aware of the danger it posed. Damn it. Shit. If your plan involved the sanctifiers straying from the path... Stop here. And don't do anything until I say so. Surprised, Uthal said nothing and instead stopped his horse and carefully brought it about. Kira dismounted, grabbed the agent's corpse from his saddle, and slammed it onto the path. There was a loud crack as a skull collided with a sharp rock. Kira drew his dagger and called upon death. His breath caught, and he saw a web of arms with seeking fingers clawing along the edge of the path, desperately trying to reach further in. The terrain beyond the path was a mess of interlocked flesh and monstrous faces. There was no time to waste. Kira nimbly cut into the man as if he were gutting an animal. He sliced through flesh, ripped through innards, and cracked the spine, severing it in two. All the while, with each cut he made, the damned of Corpse Road came closer. He was forced to endure the feel of their cold tongues, lapping away at the blood on his body. He took the portions of the man, the legs, the arms, the entrails, and spread them across the path until it was crossed with a thick line of blood and flesh. Kira took the gore-stained dagger, cut his palm once more, deeply, and spread his blood across the terrible line he had created with the agent's body. The unseen walls keeping the souls away from the path crashed down, and the spirits smashed together from the sides of the path like roiling waves, forming an impenetrable barrier of malevolent souls. Right now, while the souls are distracted... What about you? I'll be right behind you. Go! Uthal nodded and wheeled his horse about, kicking it into a gallop down the path towards Corpse Hill and the grasslands beyond. A swarm of ravenous souls writhed about Kira's legs as he stumbled to his horse and mounted. They called to him sweetly as they made their way to the wall of flesh and blood and bone. He galloped down Corpse Road, resisting the urge to recoil as the stalks of grass that lined the path brushed against his legs, for intertwined within the stalks were the misshapen forms of the trapped souls. They were elated by him. They were proud of him. They were in love with him. Kira leaned over his saddle and threw up the hard knot he had been holding in from the moment his dagger had pierced the agent's neck. Time was at last on their side. The Deadbringer was written by E.M. Markoff. Find out more at Elderet. Dot com. Voices in this audio drama by James Saw as Kira Vidal, Rish Outfield as Utal Vidal, Kadera Wade as Ilia the Herbalist, Ramon Cantarero as Kim Lafont, Emery and Rich as Colonel Sal Sam, Philip Jin as Mr. Stone, E. M. Markov as the narrator and the stranger. Gabriel Markov as Grieved Partner Dave M. Strom as The Shopkeeper DJ Pizzolatis as Tim Agent of the Bastion The theme song is Huitzilin by Sara Monroy Solis Find her on Instagram at Sari Solis